Investing friends, welcome to Bulky Bowders. Baggers, a trillion dollar industry is on the verge of a breakout. Is it high time to invest in this breakout trillion dollar industry? We'll take a look. This industry is huge and it's been obliterated uh, like biotech. It's worse. We thought biotech was bad. This industry, the upside is unbelievably huge and it's been completely decimated. Could be time. Looks like it is time. We'll take a look at this uh, big industry and spoke with Dr. Doug, uh, uh, Dr. Doug Baker uh, about his... Uh, contacts in uh, the uh, cassava uh, CMS trial. They, they went through the CMS trial. Now they're still on open label. We've been following these people. We interviewed them, uh, friends of, of contacts of, doc, of uh, Dr. Doug. And we, we, so we interviewed those uh, four people about their family members. Two of their family members, we got an update from Doug, uh, the people he's closest with. Very good stuff. We'll take a look at that. All right. Not an investment advisor, not investment advice, number one ranked stock analyst in the world. What we're doing here is the best research for you and me, the regular investor, blah, 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 blah. All kinds of changes of the show coming. Uh, NASDAQ down 0.86, S&P down 0.48%. Uh, Tom Lee, we talked about Tom Lee at the beginning of the year saying, uh, look, he's, got, he's saying it's going to be a great year. We agree. And he was right. And then earlier this summer, he said, you know, short term, I really think we're bullish here. And two weeks straight from the moment he spoke, it went up for two weeks straight. And then uh, posted in the multi-baggers discord, uh, he, he said a few days ago, looks like uh, looks like bearish, bearish in the short term. People are just listening to him. It's August. There's not many people trading, relatively speaking. And the fund manager said, oh, when he says it's going up, it's going up. When he says it's going down, it's going down. So uh, he's still bullish long term, but uh, he's causing this. He's causing this. All right, we talked about Powell. They're, uh, they've they've uh, quintupled for us. This is a dividend growth stock. They're up more than 2% today. This is, uh, they do uh, electrical components for energy. So whether it's green or, or, or not green, they're doing, they're really doing great. Anyway, up another 2% today. There is Tilray. We'll talk about Tilray today. Tilray is one of the uh, cannabis stocks that we think is looking is looking good here. We got three cannabis stocks, trillion dollar industry that's been absolutely thrown out completely. Industry has a future, it sure looks like, and there's the, the investments have been obliterated. So it looks like it could be a great time. For, there's other reasons. It looks like it could be a great time uh, to dive in. Cassava up two cents. We got an update on cassava, but let's get into. Let's get into the report. Good morning, MT Watley. Good for you. Ready for a breakout? Me too, my friend. So I asked uh, Chat GPT. So this is cannabis stocks. Give me some funny titles for uh, cannabis stocks. So high returns, joint ventures, pot of gold, weed of fortune, blazing trails to profits. I thought they were pretty funny. All right, here is the report. Let's go to uh, Tilray since it's doing well. Here is the report. Big idea is cannabis could be like similar. It's already more popular than, did you know this, than tobacco. It's about one and a half times or whatever more popular than tobacco smoking. Looks like it could be on an alcohol trajectory or perhaps maybe half of that or something like that. So what we're saying is this is huge. This industry is huge. And considering the investments are uh, completely decimated and there's reasons to think uh, things are about to get better. Uh, and there's three companies in particular that while things are as challenging as they can be, and we'll see that things are as challenging as they can be right now, while things are as challenging as they can be, these, some, uh, these three companies are actually doing really well. So here, sign up for the newsletter, the Multibaggers newsletter. This came out uh, we, last Friday. All three of these stocks are up since then. We, we pivoted to uh, biotechs getting obliterated. We're, we're going to stick with biotechs. Maybe we'll do one biotech a month and, and another type of innovation each month. We do two reports a month. Sign up. I hope you're doing well. If not, great new industry for us with tremendous markets. Looks like it is time to pounce. We thought biotech was beaten up, but this sector puts biotech's bear market to shame. It sure does. By the way, let's just take a look at MSOS. You could look at a bunch of uh, cannabis plays, but this is the cannabis ETF. And it was up here at 54 in February 2021, you know, 2021, 2020, 2021, there was the big bull market. So up at 54 and down now under five bucks. So it's off more than 90%. It's been completely thrown out. We thought biotech was bad. We thought the XBI, which has been more than cut in half, was bad. Well, this has been more than, uh, more than 90% chopped away. 
While most players are dying, as times are truly tough and players are dying, some are quietly gaining strength. And decidedly better times look to be right around the corner. There is really no comparison for the size of the opportunity and the current decimation of all the players. The gargantuan and trounced industry that might be at the perfect inflection point is cannabis. Cannabis. Cannabis markets are absolutely enormous and growing. It is already bigger than tobacco by some measures. Did you know that? More Americans now classify themselves as cannabis smokers than tobacco smokers by about one and a half to one or whatever it is. The current numbers from Gallup look like about half of Americans have tried cannabis with 17% currently using. The year before it was 48% had tried with 16% currently using. And in that year, last year, I remember smoking tobacco is going down while smoking cannabis is going up. So last year, people 11% were smoking tobacco. So it's 11, maybe even 10% smoking tobacco, 17% heading higher smoking cannabis. So maybe even more than one and a half to one, maybe getting closer to two to one. I might, it might seem that state legalization is buoying cannabis use, but cannabis, cannabis use did not seem to need much buoying. Legalization seems to be reflecting the changing attitudes rather than creating them. Also consider that in 1969, only 4% of Americans have tried cannabis, now 50%. But here is, the, this black line here is when these states have legalized. And as you can see, it doesn't really change the trajectory of use at all. So this is percentage of people using on the up and down. So you can see that is steadily rising in every state. So Alaska, Massachusetts, Oregon. And, the year, and so five years before legalization on through to five years after legalization, there seems to be no... Uh, I guess this dotted line here, who is that? Uh, Nevada. Nevada, seem, Nevada seems to have been, I guess, influenced. And maybe even a little, maybe a, maybe a little bit of Colorado. Oh, this, this is quite the trajectory. The, the legalization has very little to do with it. We'll see that it does have a little bit to do with it, but it's not the mo It's not they're legalizing it, thus people are doing it. It's the other way around. Legalizing it does make it a little more used, but mostly it's just the changing attitudes are making it legal. Interestingly, a study using data from twins in different states says twins, these are, these are always the best, when you use identical twins and then and they, they were raised in separate families and things, those are always interesting studies. Uh, twins living in different states where cannabis is legal used it about 20% more frequently than their twins where it's illegal. Okay, so there you go. You get about a 20% kicker on legalization. More than one in six Americans regularly use cannabis. Half have tried. Both numbers are growing and more 20% kickers are coming to goose those numbers as more states legalize. Cannabis markets are mammoth and growing. How mammoth are we talking? So one report has North American markets at 35 billion now, but getting close to 500 billion by 2030. And why not? When you compare it to alcohol, that's really still small. From Gallup, about 45% of Americans are weekly drinkers which is 2.65 times the rate of self-identifying cannabis users. How big is alcohol globally? In 2021, sales were 1.6 trillion, headed to 2 trillion by 2031. So if this is compared to alcohol, and alcohol is two or three times more, if it's 2 trillion in 2031, we're talking half a trillion to a trillion uh, for cannabis by, by 2030, 2031. Based on alcohol sales, a good estimate for global 2031 cannabis sales with its comparable characteristics and lusty growth rate maybe one trillion or even better. Whatever the case, cannabis markets are just plain huge along with the lines, uh, along the lines of approaching alcohol. Let me get off of MSOS because this one's not doing well. Tilray's doing well for us. Uh, the ETF, we, we, we're not, we're, so we're, what we're saying, that ETF, we're not saying buy anything in cannabis. We're gonna say we found three that are winning in these extremely challenging times and we think more are gonna die. And then, but we also think things are gonna get better and these three that are doing well now are gonna do really well. So with cannabis use becoming more popular, I guess these cannabis stocks must be crushing it, huh? Not so much. As shown by the advisor shares pure U.S. cannabis ETF MSOS that we just saw, the average cannabis stock is down more than 90% from the top. We saw it went from 54 to under 5. There was a rush of competition and prices dropped precipitously in some places. And with cannabis legal status, these companies cannot good, get good funding and some were hamstrung by loan shark uh, 
rates from private sources. In addition, regional pricing problems like stifling taxes in New York created an enormous black market that cannot be competed with legally and that can also be sourced from cheap legal states. This is a big deal in New York and some other places. They jacked up the taxes so high that the black market, and they're not enforcing, uh, they're not cracking down on the black market. So the black market is sourcing their cannabis from cheap legal states and going to the uh, high tax state of New York and selling uh, on the black market. So the legal, the legals can't, the legal shops can't compete. And so many companies have gone out of business. So that's why things are so tough right now. A uh, lot of competition came in crushing the places, prices in some places, prices in some places, uh, regional pricing, uh, regional taxing and regional enforcement created price dislocations that made it impossible for legals to compete in some markets. The legal status means they can't get funding. They also, people can't use credit cards as well, so that, that, that's also a, a bit of a headwind. But the, they can't get good funding is a big one. Uh, and then, what, well, also with the, with the legal status, they can't really do, as we'll see when we talk about Tilbury, they can't really get into distribution and infrastructure yet. Okay, so many companies have gone out of business, but things are about to get better, it would seem. Government budgets are in trouble, and they want those tax dollars. Some of these regional problems are likely to get sorted out so that governments get paid, and most of all, the federal government seems to see an opportunity to add a national excise tax to cannabis sales. So what we're saying is New York City wants its tax dollars, uh, right or wrong. I don't, think, I don't think it's going to be a question of ethics or morality. It's going to be a question of do they want their money. And yes, I think they do. Uh, and same thing with the federal government. We see, they see an opportunity to add a national excise tax to cannabis use. Thus, we are convinced that the wheels that are currently in motion will lead to federal reform. So there's been a lot of talk about this. Germany just uh, had some legislation. Other countries are doing legislation. There's a lot of talk in the U.S. markets. What it seems is that now uh, politicians are slamming on the brakes because they're not getting enough kickbacks for themselves. Nevertheless, we, don't think, we think that this represents money for the Fed, and they're going to get it in there one way or another. On October 6th of last year, so this kicked off this... Uh, federal initiative to perhaps legalize. President Biden signed a sweeping pardon of marijuana offenders and simultaneously asked Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Attorney General to review cannabis laws. That review is said to be due by the end of the year. Whatever circuitous paths, path legislation may take, we think there will be dollar signs in the eyes of lawmakers when it comes to pot and alcohol slash tobacco style legalization and excise taxing will ensue one way or another. So you can see in 2019, sources of excise tax revenue, highways, aviation, but here's tobacco and alcohol, both contributing double digit percentages. We think they, the lawmakers are going to see, uh, they're going to, going to visualize cannabis being in there and they're never going to want to take those dollars out of their budget again. They're going to put it in there. We think would cannabis legalization be a blight on society? The answer is no. It may be that cannabis is detrimental to society. Or, as we will see, it may have some benefits, but cannabis is plainly not the problematic drug that alcohol is. From the World Health Organization, uh, alcohol causes more than 200 diseases and injury conditions, 3 million deaths. Uh, that's 5.3% of all deaths. Did you know that? 5.3% of all deaths are alcohol related. Do you think that 5.3% of all deaths, no matter how much cannabis people use, could ever be cannabis related? Uh, overall, 5.1% and most, most violent crime, I don't think this says this, but in the United States, by some measures, most violent crime is alcohol related, which is not surprising. People generally don't do violent stuff and then you get drunk and you do all kinds of stuff. Overall, 5.1% of global disease burden is attributable to alcohol. Unbelievable. Uh, significant social economic losses, 13.5% of total deaths in the young people's age range. One seventh of all deaths for, for 20 to 39 year olds alcohol related. Alcohol is a blight on society. You can say cannabis is not so great, but alcohol is really poison for society. Uh, so anyway, did those cannabis using twins have more problems than their non-using siblings? Not according to the small study, but it did note that twins in states where cannabis is legal did show fewer symptoms of alcohol use disorder. Specifically, they were less likely to engage in risky behavior after drinking, such as driving while intoxicated. And we're going to see another study saw the same thing. So again, not saying that cannabis doesn't have any negative consequences, but there's a couple studies that show people drink and drive less. We're about to see that car rates, auto insurance goes down uh, and because of less uh, injuries, less crashes and less injuries. 
Uh, the study is not alone. Research in the journal Health Economics showed auto insurance rates fell upon legalization, again, because of less drunk driving. We focus on one potential detriment, the effect of cannabis legalization on automobile safety. We find that premiums declined on average by $22 per year following medical cannabis legalization. The effect is more substantial in areas near a dispensary and in areas with higher prevalence of drunk driving before legalization. We estimate existing legalization has reduced health expenses related to auto accidents by almost $820 million per year, with a potential for a further $350 million reduction if legalized nationally. A different study in Journal Health Economics, so there's two studies saying less drunk driving, and here's a study saying less tobacco smoking. A different study in Journal Health Economics looked at tobacco use. It found a replacement phenomenon, potentially with benefits. RML is recreational marijuana laws. We find that recreational marijuana laws adopted is associated with a lagged reduction in electronic nicotine delivery system use, consistent with the hypothesis that ends and marijuana are substitutes. Uh, so nicotine and marijuana are substitutes. Moreover, auxiliary and analysis of the National Survey of Drug Use and Health showed that recreational marijuana law adoption is associated with reduction in cigarette smoking. We conclude that re recreational marijuana laws may generate tobacco-related health benefits. So that's kind of surprising. You would think maybe if you're like, going to smoke one thing, you're more likely to smoke something else. It's actually the opposite, at least in that study. So again, it, you can say that pot's not that great or whatever, but alcohol, more than 5% of all deaths and one in seven if you're young, that's just, the cannabis is just, it might even have some benefits. So we are convinced that there is no real political will to stop this train, although politicians will try to hijack things to get more pork in their bills. So federal legalization is a huge possible catalyst coming down the pike. That should lead to a big pickup in sales, of course, maybe 20% based on states legalizing, uh, this, this based on the twin study. But more than that, companies can actually start to do business with actual funding infrastructure, national distribution networks, and economies of scale, all that crap. Cannabis is likely to be as ubiquitous as alcohol and tobacco, meaning everywhere, uh, as alcohol and tobacco, and the investments have been obliterated. The opportunity before us is obvious, so let's talk winners. We see three, the three musketeers of the cannabis crusade. Uh, I had four. They were the four horsemen, and, I, and then I, I soured on one of them. Uh, glass house brands, the low, low cost producer. So very interesting stuff. Uh, check out this picture of their, uh, frankly, I don't, know, I don't know if that's art or a real picture, but check out the picture of their facilities. So glass house, although called weed, high quality cannabis is difficult to grow at scale with consistency. California based glass house has gotten the formula down and has unmatched growing capacity with its greenhouses. And the cost here is ridiculous. So you can see that they, they, they really do have the, the uh, greenhouse, uh, I don't know if it's irreplaceable, but uh, it would take a, a lot to, it would take a lot just to replace the facility. And then you need the expertise uh, and the systems and the, uh, the functions and everything, the, uh, the processes that make up the whole, the whole, the whole uh, way of doing it. So anyway, they've got, you can see in Q4 2022, they were making pot for $120 a pound. We're about to see, that sounds cheap, it is. And then uh, in second half of 2023, they think they can get down to $120 a pound. Uh, $127, $120 per pound costs are incredible. The following data is from 2021 and costs will have come down a little, but these guys are having outdoor costs with indoor consistency and quality. So uh, this is from, I forget what this, is from. Uh, I forget where it's from. Anyway. Uh, median average cost to grow a pound of dried cannabis. So almost 500 bucks for indoor, two, uh, $250 for greenhouse, and 214 for outdoor. And so anyway, they're getting greenhouse down to uh, half of what other people do over greenhouse and significantly less than outdoor. And then there's, there's, cannabis actually has a spot price. Did you know that? So the spot price for pot was $963 per pound at the latest, uh, latest I saw here. So they're growing for 120, selling for 963, pretty good markup. They are vertically integrated, doing the growing, branding, and selling. So remember, Tesla is vertically integrated. So uh, Elon says that ideas are cheap and easy, but uh, manufacturing and scaling at profitably uh, is what's difficult. So what he's doing with Tesla is he's controlling the whole process. They're actually doing the mining. 
or some of the mining, uh, and then and then creating the parts themselves rather than ordering the parts from these manufacturers. And in the end, they do they even go all the way through to selling the cars themselves. They don't outsource anything really, so they're vertically integrated. Uh, and uh, Gla Glasshouse growing itself, growing its own stuff, branding its own stuff, selling its own stuff. As the low cost producer growth is terrific and they are approaching cash flow positivity, Glasshouse is winning the price war and putting competitors out of business. We said a lot of competitors are going out of business. Here's one reason why. It has started to rebound lately, but it's still well off its highs. So it was up 12 or $13. It has bounced since its January lows, but it still seems to have a ways to go. If it's, if it's going to survive, uh, it still has a ways to go. And I think it is going to survive. Grown Rogue, so Grown Rogue cash flow positive craft cannabis. Grown Rogue is so glass houses in California. Grown Rogue is in Oregon, the ultra competitive market of Oregon. They are growing, branding, and selling craft cannabis, high quality cannabis that is relatively affordable. So low end, bulk, broad mass market, and then there's the ultra premium. So right below the ultra premium is where they fit in uh, high quality stuff that's not quite as expensive. Management has done a terrific job in the toughest of markets. While peers go under, Grown Rogue has eked out free cash flow positivity. So pretty darn good. This is from, this is the last few years now. They actually got positive back here and then it looks like they're actually. So free cash flow is we know money comes in over a period, money goes out over a period. The difference is free cash flow. So one year might be an anomaly. Maybe they had all their expenses last year or more expenses next year. Uh, but if you look at it over the years, so they look, they look pretty good. They look like they're for a few years now, and they're, and they're even getting, poking their heads up into making some money. So in these toughest of conditions, especially in Oregon, they're, they're doing, they're making, they're getting by. So who knows? We'll see if they can maintain it, but they are doing well in the toughest of conditions. When things turn, they could be a big winner. The shares have stabilized lately and even tripled off the bottom, tripled off the bottom from here. However, plenty remains as the company needs a literal 100,000 X from here to retain former glory. <laughs> so these things have been obliterated. And then there is Tilray. Distribution makes brands. Being the low cost producer is not the only way to have the lowest costs. Renowned author, investor, professor Bruce Greenwald gives a terrific lecture on what makes Coke's brand the best. It is not the brand that is the best per se. It is that Coca-Cola enjoys the most efficient distribution and can spend. So, uh, he, he has, Mr. Uh, Greenwald, when he teaches his classes, he enjoys asking everybody, what's the most powerful brands in the world? And people say Coca-Cola sometimes. And he says, now, when you want to impress your spouse's parents, do you go over to their house and, and slap down a six pack of Coke on the, on the uh, table there? Uh, anyway, uh, his point about that is that they, those are not, they are not the best bands, brands because they're the best brands per se, as we're about to see. They have the most money to spend on marketing because they have the cheapest distribution. Therefore, they have the most money to tell you over and over that they are the best brand. <laughs> so it is not the best brand per se. It is that Coca-Cola enjoys the most efficient distribution and thus can spend the most money to tell people their brand is terrific. Their brand is the best. So here's Bruce. What is ultimately crucial because customers die and technologies die is that you have advantages in the market for new technology and new, new customers. That means you have to dominate those markets. You have to have economies of scale. So in those 10 countries where Coke makes all of its profit, why does it make the profit? Because it dominates distribution and distribution is a huge fixed cost in those markets and it can offer lower prices and it can advertise more in those geographies than its competitors. So it can recruit new customers on a favorable basis. That's what he's saying about new technology that he just means a new, a way of getting, a way of getting customers. He's just saying you have a cost advantage so you can recruit new customers with your advertising. So being the low cost producer is not the only way to have the lowest costs and to have the most for marketing. Tilray has about equal exposure to recreational cannabis, European medical cannabis, and alcohol, both spirits and assorted beer brands. Tilray has cannabis infused beverages and all of its newly acquired drinks can be cannabis infused as well. Those are all interesting product niches on their own. But as the CEO points out, it allows for crucial infrastructure and distribution advantages. Whereas Glass House and Grown Road look like acquisition targets to us, perhaps from Big Tobacco, we think Tilray has a chance to be an acquirer and major player for years to come. Tilray is getting close to free cash flow positive and its stock has recovered somewhat. So it's recovered somewhat, but it also has a long way to go to get back to former glory. These, these stocks have been obliterated. 
That's it for now. Please keep this under your hat until we talk about on the show today. Come join us for Q&A on the Zoom call on Sunday. Details below. And here is the Discord link if you need it. We had a Zoom call over the weekend that was really great. So that's Tilray is up since we talked about it. So is Glasshouse and so is Grown Rogue. I don't know how they're doing today, but uh, they're up since we talked about them. So this could be, it could be a good time, even as the market, even as, uh, so they're flat today, even as uh, the market has been br brutal on the other innovations, biotech and stuff, this stuff could be, these three are looking pretty good. Eunice said, good morning, Joe and all. Cannibalized, legalized it, and nothing's gone wrong. Yeah, the uh, the you can say it's not that great. I'm not saying it's that great, but it's it's really it's not a blight on society. It, it was made out to be, but it's really not. <laughs> Jeff says, first cannabis, then one month later, you're injecting crystal meth into your veins. Well, there's studies here that say less drunk driving and less tobacco smoking. So even though it was called the gateway drug or whatever, maybe that's not true. I just turned in and heard cannabis. <laughs> Go on. You had me at cannabis. Uh, YouTube says blurry too much cannabis. If you're too blurry, it's on your side. All right, let's do, let's do cassava. I spoke with Dr. Doug yesterday and uh, we talked about, uh, he has some contacts that are, uh, have some family members in the, uh, in the, uh, CMS trials. It's already over, but now they're in the open label extension. So the CMS trial, remember, it was one year of open label. Everybody took somiflam. These are Alzheimer's patients. And then six months uh, placebo or the drug, then six more months of the drug. And then everybody goes on open label and gets the drug again. So these people have been on the drug for about two and a half months. I got an update on two of them. He's close to someone who is close to two of these people. And uh, both of these people, very interestingly, this is Dr. E's father. And then she, she was friends with the other doctor. I forget who his name, but it was his mother-in-law. So if you remember, Dr. E's father was also a doctor. And after he started Semifilem, the one uh, thing he, he was, he was reading somebody's blood work at a picnic, sort of off the cuff, which he would have never have done before Semifilem. So that's him. And then there is the woman who was a very gracious, kind woman who, in addition to her memory problems, had very bad behavioral problems. She became an unkind, nasty person. Uh, and so I got an update on both of them. Let me grab. You know, I don't think I grabbed my, I made some quick notes. Let me grab my notes real quick. Grab my notes real quick. I apologize. I made notes and you know what? I'm gonna, I forgot. I went to grab them and then I didn't and I forgot. Uh, well, people want to hear this stuff, so I guess you'll stick around anyway. All right, I'll go for memory. Sorry, God darn it. I, forget. I can't find the notes I made on this. No matter. I, I, I remember it anyway. Okay, so I, I talked to Doug yesterday. He told, First of all, he, uh, Matt Nachtrob posted this uh, after Doug's, Doug posted an update, I guess, online. So, the, the, yeah, so the, here's, here's Doug posting online. In this time of trial and tribulation, I want to report back on the two individuals I personally know who entered the semifilam study over two and a half years ago, both are dramatically better than when they entered the study in December of 2020. So Dr. E's father, both of them, uh, is better than baseline. We think it looks like Dr. E's father was off the drug for six months and he seemed to have gotten worse. And then when he got back on, he got better and better. Uh, but that six months where it seemed like he was on placebo, it seemed to have cost him. Nevertheless, 
uh, Dr. E is with, with a couple of stories I'll relate to you. She, uh, she says he's better than he was two and a half years ago at baseline. And the woman, Dr. E's father just had his 65th wedding anniversary and was fully present, uh, cutting thing, the cake with, with his wife and everything like that. Uh, the woman who also has Alzheimer's was there because they know each other. She, they said that you would not know that she has Alzheimer's disease. She could not be left alone. Uh, she for, couldn't remember names. She could not be left alone. She could not cook, but she could not be left alone. If her husband went to work, she would, she would hound him constantly because she was just too, uh, too scared and anxious to be alone and became really mean and nasty. Two and a half years on semiflame, and it looks like she did not get placebo, but she got the drug the whole time. They said you would not know she has Alzheimer's, which is incredible. Well, while Dr. E was over there visiting, uh, she said that uh, her dad went outside uh, because her mom said, can you go water the flowers? And her dad went out and watered the flowers and then came back in 45 minutes. Uh, he went out and did the yard work. When I came back in 45 minutes later and said, oh, is, uh, is Dr. E still here? Is my daughter still here? Because I, I wanted to tell her something. And they, both the mother and daughter agreed, he would have never uh, remembered that she was still there. And he came and just came looking for her because after he did his, you know, he's out in the yard doing something else for 45 minutes, he knows she's still there. He would have never remembered that. Let's keep going with what else he says here. Both have completed CMS and are still taking somiflam. Fortunately, Cassava's providing the medication. They both are better from a cognitive, ambulatory, and social interactive perspective. No drug side effects. Hanging there long, your respect will be rewarded. In December 2020, the one individual would not leave her house. She would not interact in a social situation. She was irritable. Her husband could only get, leave her side for a short amount of time. This past Sunday, she was large at a large 65th wedding anniversary celebration, laughing, remembering names, enjoying life. Not possible two and a half years ago. The other individual has had improvement in his ambulatory skills, short-term memory. Both families feel very best opportunity to take some mithalam. All right. Uh, so I, I, think, I think I got everything from my notes. I think it was everything from my notes. Um, I want to make sure I got everything from the, he, he, uh, everything went well at that 65th party and they were just very happy and I'm, gosh, I'll, 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 I'll find my notes and I'll, I'll bring in whatever else I forgot. Uh, darn it. Sorry about that. Uh, but I'll, I'll find my notes and bring whatever else I forgot about that. But it was all very good news. Both of them are far better. The woman, you wouldn't know she has Alzheimer's. Oh, and they were both diagnosed, he told me, as moderate which is very interesting. We had spoken in the multi-baggers discord. A lot of these symptoms of these people look moderate. And then when the CMS came back, it's like, nah, it's not really helping moderates, but maybe it is. Maybe some people got in there that were past moderate. Who knows? Uh, Doug and I were speculating. The phase threes have those blood tests for screening. More than three quarters of the CMS did not have any screening other than just being generally diagnosed by your doctor, which is not very good. So, uh, cassava going after moderates, we were, said, we were saying that was looking like a mistake. Maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they knew what they were doing. Maybe. And then if people that have moderates, I mean, they're the ones that need help the most. So, uh, that, that very, could be very encouraging. So, I'll get my notes if, if there was anything else. I think that was it. Uh, his Sham says, one day we'll look back at this video and be proud of our efforts, sp time spent on Sava. Correct. Oh, also, my apologies for the, when I was doing the, you couldn't see some of the, couldn't see some of the charting when I was showing that. When stock price, do you estimate will be the bottom for Sava? Uh, we could have already seen it. I don't know. Joe, Tom Lee predicted Bitcoin 124,000. Your thoughts? Definitely. I am very bullish Bitcoin. Very, and it just dipped, had that little flash crash. This is a good time to buy some Bitcoin. I think it's a great time to buy some Bitcoin. Thanks for the info, says Richard. My brother-in-law is down 90% on these pot stocks. Sounds like good news. I think Tilray, Grown Rogue, and Glass House. Uh, when I, a few years ago, when I looked at these, I looked at True Leave, and they were fra free cash flow positive at the time. And I was like, oh man, this could be one. And they went way up. And then uh, the market got more competitive and they made a terrible acquisition. And now they're losing more and more and more and more money and their price is lower than it's ever been. I think truly has gone out of business. I think a lot of them are still going out of business. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't buy the field, but I like these three. 
The new stuff in the background looks awesome. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's a terrible disease that is beyond traffic. Sava may have such a math, make such a massive difference. This was the most encouraging thing I've heard in a while. Uh, the fact that they were diagnosed moderate and that she couldn't be left alone. And now that she, now she's like, you wouldn't know that she has Alzheimer's. That's, that, that's, that, that, that was very good stuff. JC, hi, Joe, happy Friday. You haven't mentioned it, but yesterday IKT announced completion of the 5 I did not mention it, but what I did do was uh, reach out to Dr. Milton Werner and invite him for an interview a week from today. I have not heard back, so we will see if, if we get that interview or not. But yeah, we, you know we've been bullish on that, that program. People with uh, leukemia don't want to take uh, this drug because it gives them stomach upset, GI issues. Well, they have a pro drug that doesn't break down to the real drug until after it goes through the passes through the stomach wall, intestinal walls, and absorbs. Now it can break down and something doesn't bother you. So it looks like they had a really great drug, and, and it came back. Well, look, it just said the drug is working like the regular drug. The pro drug is working like the regular drug. Perfect. So yeah, so I invited them on the show for next Friday. We'll see if we get them. All right, great to see you guys. We'll do it again on Monday. Uh, more changes for the show come out. Can't make anybody happy. I'm just going to have to step it up and do everything every day, I think. Because I'm not, I, I love the dividend stuff, but people are like, if you don't talk about biotech every day, we hate you. <laughs> so I guess I got to talk about biotech every day as well as the other stuff every day. So I'm just going to step it up, I think, and just do more content. We'll see. But we got changes on the show coming. We'll see what we can do. Hillary's father was definitely moderate as well. I reached out to her. I have not heard back, but yes, I think he was moderate as well. Hey, Joe, are you still in touch with any of the patients you interviewed last year? It would be great. This is them. This is them. I'd spoken with Dr. E quickly and gave a quick update that she said that things were pretty good, but this was a more in-depth update. Uh, so yeah, that, that, this, this is them, Dr. E, and maybe it was Dr. A. I can't remember. Can't remember. All right, great to see you guys. We'll do it again uh, on Monday, and I'll see you in the Discord. Sign up for the newsletter. You get great reports like that. A week ahead of time, two per month. We got ten doubles already, and it has been. This is not the time to capitulate. This, this is the time people are capitulating. This is the time for biotech. We saw biotech is in a two and a half year bear. It takes two to three years for capitulation. ADC we saw is in a more than two year bear. These pot stocks are in a more than two year bear. This is capitulation time. So this is not the time for us to be capitulating. This is official. Bloody blood in the streets. So uh, if, if you think biotech has a future, if unless it's going to go away as a sector, if you think pot stocks have a future, unless they're going to go away, this could be, uh, if you think real estate for that matter, which has been obliterated, this could be really good times for some of these. All right, great to see you guys. Thanks for all your hard work. This is D-Reader. My pleasure, my friend. Great to see you. And I will see you guys in the Discord. Have a great night. See you in the Discord.